church. I want to welcome our friends on the live stream. High Point in St. Thomas, great to see you today. Uh, you were not experiencing technical difficulties. If you're saying, what's wrong with my computer that the countdown started again? We are actually having our life group introduction Sunday. We've been having a brunch uh, between the last two services. Um, so uh, we are very well full with food right now. Those of here that, that are live, if you are out in the lobby, or if you are outside of the lobby, please feel free to load up your plate. You can bring it on in. Um, we are going to spend some time worshiping our King this morning. Jesus is great. Jesus is worthy of everything that we can bring to him. So I want to encourage you as we enter into a time of worshiping through music today, I want you to stand to your feet and I want you to bring something to your God. Bring him your voice. If you regularly already bring him your voice, bring him some raised hands. If you already bring him that, maybe bring him a clap and a little groove. If that's just too weird for you, you're also welcome to just kind of sit where you are. And at least focus your heart and your mind and your actions on the King who's worthy. Jesus, we love you. God, we bless you and we honor you in this house. And we're asking you, sir, that you would first of all be glorified and second of all that you would be among us. Amen. Let's stand and worship God this morning.
See you. 
church, this is a house of miracles. This is a house of comfort, a house of healing, a house of power, a house of might, a house of restoration, a house of salvation, a house of reconciliation, a house of forgiveness. Because we declare the name of Jesus in this place, that is why we can call this house a house of those things. And your homes are extension of this house. So your house has, it's truth based on what the word says, but your house has something unique also. And so I believe today God wants to tell you what your house is a house of. Of course, it's all those things I mentioned that in general make sense for, for the family of faith, but there's something specific God either wants to confirm about your house or wants to speak into your house. So in just a moment, we're going to take a moment where you are just going to tune in to the voice of God. And just as surely as this place is a house of miracles and salvation, healing, comfort, hospitality, praise, wisdom, your house is something unique for you and for the world. And so if you would, would you just bow your heads, close your eyes. Heavenly Father, for each home represented here, no matter how many people dwell in it, God, it's a home. And God, I know you have graced each home uniquely with all of your truths and all of its power, but something special that each of us bring into this world. And I ask God right now, as we turn our ears and our hearts towards your voice, would you fill in the blank of this phrase, your house is a house of, so Heavenly Father, speak now, my house is a house of, was a declaration and for some here it was an intercession and so I pray right now God over each household that you would be to that house exactly who you said you'd be in your word and who you told them that you would be right now as we lift up your name in each of our homes in Jesus name amen amen thank you Jennifer good morning Please go ahead and have a seat. Unless your name's Debbie Adio, then you can come up front. I want to welcome again our friends on the live stream. So glad you're with us, particularly our folks in St. Thomas and our new friends in Puerto Rico. Glad you are uh, with us today. My name's Keith. I'm the lead pastor here. If you uh, happen to wonder what my problem is, if I'm sheening up top, it's been Life Group Sunday, so we've been standing outside um, in the heat uh, serving you, but it is worth it because Life Group's rock. All right, so we've got a, a very special, let's slide center camera if you will. We've got a very special uh, a moment uh, that we have here. Many of you know Debbie. She has been our worship leader here for the last seven years. We're making a transition right now from Debbie as our former worship leader to Nika as our uh, new and future worship leader. It's a transition that's already taken place among the team and among the staff, and it's been about a year or so uh, in the making, but we want to do, do two things. Number one, we want to honor Debbie uh, for a time of service, and number two, we want to go ahead and install Nika publicly in front of each of you. Um, Debbie and her husband Joe have been coming to the church for about 11 years, and when they came, they, they were a little crispy, a little burnt out maybe from ministry and some different things. They've been used in very high capacities in the kingdom of God for a long period of time, and so they just kind of kind of sat and engaged in a lot of different ways, and then eventually Debbie started uh, singing up here. As you know, she's a, an unbelievable singer, and our worship team had gone through a couple very good and very God transitions. We uh, had a worship leader that we sent over, slash he moved over to Tampa uh, to lead worship at our, our sister church over there, and immediately in his place, we put one of our associate pastors at the time, Andy King, and uh, Andy was also in the process of getting ready to go plant a new church for us in Atlanta. So he filled the gap, and then he was getting ready to go. And while we've got a very talented team, we didn't have anybody necessarily that was sort of next in line uh, to lead. And Debbie has led worship at some very high levels uh, in different places around the country. 
And she was so gracious at that point, refreshed by God here, uh, to step up and take the mantle. And, you know, sometimes you look at worship leading and go, well, that's nice. They just get a microphone and get to sing. It's like American Idol or something like that. And it's, it's just not. There is so much that goes into this from song selection, selection to really in many ways pastoring this team and, uh, you know, helping them with their own spiritual lives. And, and there's just tons and tons. What you see by way of showing up on Sunday morning is uh, really icing on the cake. And guys, we had a gift with Debbie leading worship for us. But she and Joe were about to open the most palatial Taj Mahal of all Chick-fil-A's in the world. This is a massive uh, step up. Their, their Chick-fil-A has been killing it for years over on Sand Lake Road. And, and they really have, a, in many ways, a, a promotion. And because they're partners in life and in, in, in their business for the past year, She's had to devote much more attention to that. It's getting to open September 2nd. September 2nd. You need to be there eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, supporting this new venture. But th so so they're, they're, they're staying here locally, praise God. They're staying here in High Point, and their influence will continue to be felt. But she's taking a, a, a transitionary role here with regards to leading worship. She'll still be part of the team and sing, but the mantle of leadership is being passed. And if you know anything about Debbie and why we're gonna honor her is not just for time serving, but for the quality of service that she gave us. Week after week, for seven years, you encountered God because of the work that she put in. Week after week after week, you had Sundays where the kids were crying on the way here and then you were crying on the way in. And you found an encounter with the presence of God himself because of what she had been doing all week long in her personal life while leading a family, while helping lead a business. Debbie has been a full-time employee for the last seven years on a volunteer salary. She's worked full-time for a grand total of zero cents. She's been giving. She's been giving of her gifts. She's been giving of her leadership most importantly, she's been giving of a life that's been cultivated in God's presence. She's been giving of a heart of worship. And she has done an amazing job, not just leading us in worship, but developing the rest of the team to the point where now we can install somebody in their 20s that can take that mantle and run and continue to take us to another level. And I've mentioned that worship leading is not easy because Debbie's human. So she's had those days where somewhere between that door of stressed out, midnight calls, somebody's like, I'm sick on Saturday night at midnight. Well, where do you find somebody else to fill in that spot? Or on Sunday morning, I'm on my way and my car broke down. Where do you, like, the amount of things that can go wrong for this to happen, and they just, they just do because it's life. And I have watched Debbie encounter, you know, just unforeseen hiccups with regards to the team right before service and rather than panic being near panic somewhere between that door and this platform she encountered God and stood up here not frazzled not rattled so that you could encounter God church we are grateful to have had a caliber of worship leader and grateful to have a caliber of human being and follower of Jesus like we have in Debbie Adio. So Debbie, we honor you. We love you. We appreciate everything about you. What I would like is for you to give it up for the best worship leader this church has ever seen like you actually mean it. Thank you. Team, lay hands on her while Pastor Ross prays for her. Jesus, we thank you so much for the gift that Debbie has been to this house for the last seven years. God, in the, in, in the position of leading this team, Father. And so uh, we just pray, Jesus, that 
as she goes from glory to glory, God, that this next season of life, God, would be an amazing season for her, God. All the things that she's sown, God, the prayers that she's sown that nobody else saw, God, the time that she's sown that no one else saw, the counseling, the pastoring that happened, God, on this team because of her life, God, we pray that you would return it to her a hundredfold. And God, we pray, Jesus, that this next season of life would be blessed, it would be prosperous, that she and Joe would be able to reap God, the, the blessings, God, of all of the time, of all the energy, of all the prayers, God, of all the worship that has gone up before you on behalf of this team. And so, God, we just thank you so much for them. We ask that you would minister to them, Jesus, yes. and that, uh, that you would just repay her over and over again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Church, I can tell you with the utmost confidence, I would not be who I am as a Jesus follower if Debbie had not said yes seven years ago. And I can say with the utmost confidence that you would not be who you are in your Christian walk if she had not said yes. So Debbie, we truly appreciate you. Uh, we're different because of you. But this isn't necessarily a sad moment. This is a proper moment. We're in a series called Glow Up where we're actually talking about this idea of young children, young men, and fathers. And it's not necessarily gendered terms, but it's, it's, it's growth and part of being a good leader is not that you lead well, it's that other leaders come up underneath you. And Nika is an exceptional leader. I want you to know this, church. We would never stand somebody up here in front of you, whether it's to preach the word, whether it's to teach a class, whether it's to lead you in worship, if their character was not proven beyond a shadow of a doubt to be one that is fully surrendered to God and humble before him. If they didn't have some measure of gifting and talent to stand before you, either lead you in worship or lead you in preaching. And if we didn't personally know who they were in the faith. Now, Nika's energetic and vibrant and talented and gifted, and if that is all she was, we would not be making this transition. Because we're not setting, setting her in to be vibrant, young, and dynamic and talented. We're setting her in to lead. And friends, her character before Jesus is tested and proven. I've watched it. Pastor Ro Ross has watched it. Pastor Heather's watched it. We've tested it. We've pushed it. We've stretched it. We've tried to bend. We've given her every opportunity to run. We've given her every opportunity to crack. We have given her every opportunity to choose other than Jesus. And every single time she stays anchored into him. Her character's proven. Her leadership is unquestioned. We've watched her grow and mature. She's doing incredible things on the college campuses. She's doing amazing things around the world, leading our missions department. And when leadership transition happens both, and God's so good and so sovereign, Debbie's season was coming to an end because of their, their new business, and they, it, just, it just had to. But even if that wasn't happening, Nika's growth as a leader was making room for itself. And we find ourselves at this perfect intersection where Debbie's time is over, and if it wasn't, it was, we were going to have to do something because Nika's time has arrived. She's a leader. And she's gifted. We were just in Puerto Rico, by the way, just in case you're wondering. We got home from Puerto Rico last night at 4 a.m. We are not going to stop moving or we'll die. We're like sharks at the moment. You might be going, Nika's got so much energy. Nika got to her house at 4 a.m. After pulling heaven out of the sky and dropping it in the lap through worship with these Puerto Rican college students. When she leads, I think God stops whatever he's doing and go, oh, I got to get me some of this. And because that's how she walks with God and that's how she worships with God, you and I get to encounter heaven when she leads us. We are in capable hands. We are in tested hands. We are in anointed and graced hands. And it is a privilege to move from the greatest worship leader we've ever had to the next greatest worship leader we've ever had. Extend your hands, extend your faith. Father, we thank you for Nika. You say in your word, O oh God, that every good and perfect gift comes from you, and we receive both Debbie and Nika in this next season as
as your gift to us to help us corporately encounter you in ways that we just can't do alone. And Father, we affirm and attest to the fact that her character is above reproach. And God, we publicly affirm and attest that her leadership capacity is great and has been made evident to every one of us. And Lord, we, we, we publicly affirm and attest that she's darn good at this. So Father, she checks every box. And Father, I thank you that the love that she has for you and the love that she has for us, we get to encounter you differently because of it. So Father, we set her in right now. We call her the director of this team. Every bit of responsibility, every bit of leadership, every bit of anointing, Father, we pass to this woman of God. And we say this isn't the culmination of a step. It's the beginning of a great moment for us as a church and for Nika as a leader and for this incredible sacrificial team. God, we bless her. Let your grace be on her. Let your hand be on her. Speak to her in visions and dreams. And we receive her as the one that's going to lead us to you in moments of worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you give it up for your brand new worship leader? So if you get this sudden urge on your drive to church on Sunday morning, you hear this killer song, and you want to text Debbie and go, you should play this in 15 minutes, uh, text Nika with that now. <laughs> and she won't reply, but she still loves you. All right. Thank you guys so much. Um, wow, what a time. Come on. All right. We are going to jump into the Word of God. We're in our uh, series we're calling Glow Up, which is about uh, basically spiritual growth, kind of taking a step to the next level. Um, and we're going to start today's message a little bit differently. Oftentimes, right about now, I'd telling, be telling you some story about something I didn't do well. But since we're talking about spiritual growth, I want us to take a step forward and grow right here, right now. If you've been watching the news, you know that our world is in a tumultuous place, to say the least. 2020 was the craziest year any of us lived through and are still living through. We've had a pandemic, we've had challenges of division all across our society. But just recently, the entire world has found itself embroiled in a couple major crises. The island nation of Haiti, Within the past month, the head of their government, I don't know if he's a president or a prime minister, I forget exactly what his title is, but he was assassinated in a coup. And nobody has filled that leadership void just in time for a 7.2 earthquake, just in time to be followed by a direct hit from a hurricane. The people in Haiti are struggling in a big way. If you've been watching or following the news at all, you know that the nation of Afghanistan is in the middle of an absolute disaster. A military and a humanitarian disaster is taking place there right now that is gonna affect history and it's gonna affect nations beyond its own borders. And sometimes we can sit here and look at these things and go, like, who, stop opening the seals up there, right? Like, like leave that stuff, and we, like, what in the heck is going on and more than what in the heck is going on what can we even do about it one of the most helpless feelings is when you know that pain and turmoil and chaos are happening and and you can't do anything and you watch and you hear and there's heartbreaking images and horrific things and you just go what do we do and the temptation is to slip into despair. But let me tell you something. The people of God are uniquely qualified, unlike anybody else on, on earth, to have a different response than other people do. Because we serve the king of the universe. And I want to give you a little simple acronym for how to handle life when it feels overwhelming or how to handle 
approach some of these large-scale global situations about which you feel like you can do nothing. It's a simple little acronym I invented called HAP. Maybe it's short for happy. Maybe it's just H-A-P. I don't know. You decide. Use it however you want. H-A-P. The people of God in moments of chaos and turmoil, either personally or as a family or on a large scale societally or on globally, are called to first and foremost be people of hope. H. You're called to be people of hope. How in the world do you respond differently than everybody else who can't find hope and is stuck in a place of despair? It's very simple. Spend more time in Scripture than you do on the evening news. Spend more time in the Word of God than you spend on social media. You have access to God's written Word and His Spirit to illuminate it to you, to help you understand what's happening in the world. And even if it doesn't help you understand what's happening in the world, it helps illuminate us to a king who does understand what's happening in the world and is sovereign over the affairs of man. The challenge comes when I consume more news, which we need to, to figure out the facts of what's happening, and then social media to maybe get some interpretation and some opinion on what's happening. If I consume more of that than I do of the word of God, what I find is I'm in as much despair as the next person. And in desperate times, the, people, the world does not need more despairing people. It needs people of hope. More time in the Word of God, and I'm a news junkie. More time in the Word of God than in the news. More time in the Word of God than in social media. And if you will do those, you will start to... Build for yourself a lens and a grid for how to interpret some of the things that are happening. Person of hope. That's your age. You and I need to also be people of action. The church of Jesus Christ is a force that is on the move. And we are supposed to be people of action. Now, you have to become a person of hope first in order to become a person of action. If you're not a person of hope, you're going to end up being a person of reaction. And the world does not need any more hopeless reaction. It's not what it needs. It needs hope-inspired action. Time in the Word of God, more there than in the news and in social media. And then we also need to be people ready and willing to do something. Now, if you're looking at Haiti and you're looking at Afghanistan and something in you is going like, what can we do? What do I do? Like this, this sense of like, I wish I could do something, but you almost feel constrained or handcuffed. Like, I can't, what do I do? That's actually a sign that God's Spirit's alive in you. Because the church is supposed to do, to demonstrate the love of God in the earth. And it is super difficult to remain hopeful when you also don't know how to act in response. It's tough. Which is why we anchor into hope first. And the most helpless place is when you see something happening and it, it's like too big. What do we do? What you do is you wait until God shows you what to do. That's action. You don't just start doing stuff. Not every action is good and not every reaction is good. You wait until we know what God's going to have us do. He's going to give us a little place to help somebody in this process, I promise you. Want to be people of hope, people of action, and last, we need to be people of prayer. And this is something we can do and we're going to do right now. We'll be people of prayer. And sometimes, even in a, something of this scale, it's like, I don't even know where to pray. Well, here's the good news. If we're first people of hope in the Word of God, the scripture tells us tons of things that we can pray. And even right here, right now, and, 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 and at home, I'm going to ask you to do the same thing. We're going to take just a couple minutes here, and we're going to pray for at least two specific things that scripture's clear on. In Psalm 34, verse 18, it says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. There are some people that are suffering big time right now. And it breaks our heart, but imagine 
the loss and the trauma that they're dealing with and what that's doing to their heart and the crushing that's happening in their spirit. We can talk to a God who has a promise that he will be close to them. And if you can't figure anything else out to do, we can grab a passage like that and remind God who's not a respecter of persons. He's not going, well, I'm only going to be close to the Americans and not to the Afghans. That's not what he does. He's near to those who are in heartbreaking situations. And ultimately, the glory that we know is in heaven is actually greater in scope and scale to the pain and catastrophe that's capable of happening here on earth. And if those two things meet up, the glory of God wins and hope and comfort can come to people in extraordinarily difficult situations. The other thing we can do biblically, and we're actually commanded to do, is to pray for leaders. Pray for those who are in decision-making positions. Scripture says that righteousness exalts a nation. We've got one nation just off our shores and another nation that we've been invested in as a country for 20 years that needs some order to take place. And God does that through righteous leadership. And there are world leaders right now that are struggling to figure out what to do. And they need to hear from heaven and not from people that have an agenda around them. So we can pray for leaders. We're going to do both of those things right now. First thing I'm going to ask you to do is if you're here with a family or you're tuning in online and you're a couch or if you're here by yourself, it doesn't matter. Just silently where you are or quietly with somebody that you're here that you're related with. I want us to pray for comfort and for God to show up for those who are hurting both in Haiti and Afghanistan. We're going to pray for them right now. Then I'll kind of pray out loud for us and then we'll pray for leadership but for right now would you please just take a moment and pray for those who are hurting and in extraordinary circumstances in Haiti and Afghanistan Jesus, we're asking you to help. I pray those that are terrified right now, God, you would reveal yourself to them. Surely as Elisha was his servant Gehazi and he was freaking out as their town was laid siege to. And Elisha said, God, would you open Gehazi's eyes? And you did, sir, and he saw the armies of heaven arrayed on a hill and came to the conclusion that there are more for us than there are against us. Father, those who feel besieged right now, who feel trapped, who are scared and terrified, would you open their eyes to the reality that you are for them and moving on their behalf. God, we turn our eyes to the hills to where our help comes from. God, I pray you bring comfort for those who have lost people and are struggling and hurting. Show up in a way that only you can. You said you're close to the brokenhearted. Let them feel your closeness. You say you save those who are crushed in spirit. Save them from the horror they're experiencing in Jesus' name. Take a moment now and pray for leadership. Haiti's a headless government right now. Afghanistan's in full chaos. And powers around the world are trying to figure out what to do. Let's ask God for wisdom, discernment, insight, courage.
Father, in this hour where so many leaders don't know what to do, I'm reminded of Solomon as we worshiped you and sacrificed before you and you came to him, God, and you said to him, I've seen your sacrifice. What would you like me to do? And God, I thank you, even as Solomon said, I would like wisdom to know how to lead your people well. God, we ask on behalf of leaders around the globe for wisdom to know how to lead people well. I'm asking for an outpour of wisdom from heaven like the same that you gave to Solomon. And people said of him, there's never been one like this guy that knows what to do. Raise up some Solomons in this hour. Grace them with wisdom. Grace them with courage. Father, silence every false voice that's freaking out around them and doesn't know what to do. We bind those in the name of Jesus. Help our leaders. We trust in the king of the universe. The king above all kings. The Lord above all lords. And ask that from you, God, would flow the ability to lead in this terrible hour. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Keep praying for those situations. We're in week two of a series we're calling Glow Up, which is kind of a, all the cool kids say it with regards to sort of like growing up, kind of going to the next level. We're in 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. We started there last week. We'll conclude there next week. 1 John chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. says, I am writing to you, little children, <coughs> because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, to you young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. 1 John was written by Jesus, one of his closest buddies, John, for whom the Gospel of John is named. And 1 John's kind of interesting because it doesn't start with a, a, a salutation that's very typical of the other epistles in the New Testament. You know, oftentimes we see Paul or Peter write, hey, to the church in Ephesus, right? There's a specific gathering of believers, or at least a specific community of gatherings of believers. And oftentimes those letters that have a direct salutation are written to specific churches for a specific purpose. Maybe they're trying to address something that's happening there. And one of the challenges sometimes in our modern theology is we take a verse and we try to apply it beyond the context of which it is meant to apply because Paul or John or various people are writing to certain people addressing certain things that they're doing. But when you see a letter like 1 John that has no specific greeting, this is a letter that was passed around among churches in a much wider region, probably in this case we would imagine throughout modern Turkey. So this is not something for a church or one leader or a specific situation like, hey, you know, over there at High Point, why don't you adjust this? Why don't you turn the music down a little bit? Like it's not a, it's not a global thing. Typically it'd be for a leader, but with no salutation. This is for believers everywhere and in every time. So John is talking to those believers and he's in many ways talking to us about how we grow. And he uses this strange kind of literary device he just repeats this i'm writing to you i'm writing to you i'm writing to you and then he actually changes it says almost the exact same thing and says i write to you i write to you i write to you and when he says i am writing to you the tense there is like now it's something that i'm actively doing i am writing to you young children i'm writing to you fathers i'm writing to you young men and then it looks the same but it's not he says, I write to you, children. I write to you, fathers. I write to you, young men. And many translations literally make it a little bit more explicit about what's happening there. And they say, I am writing to you, or I write to you. 
write to you, write to you, write to you, present tense. And then it says, I wrote to you, or have written to you, have written to you, have written to you, past tense. The way we read it today doesn't look like it implies it, but it is saying the same things because it says, I am writing and then I write. It's a present tense and it's past tense. And it's the exact same thing kind of mashed together in like a, you know, little sandwich or something. And, and here's what he's saying. When he says, I write to you, and then he says, I wrote to you, that wrote is not referring to like a prior letter or, hey, in this other sermon, I talked to you. It's not something that he did. It's something that he just did. Like, I'm writing to you. And, oh, by the way, I just wrote to you. Like, he's, he's, he's past tensing what he just did present tense. And it's kind of a strange way to write past tense about something that they literally, it's, it's only past tense because they just read it and now they're reading it again and it's past tense from the present that just happened. Y'all track them with me. So essentially what he's saying or doing here is in the first I'm writing to you, he's writing to them to remind them of something. In present tense, I'm reminding you young children. In present tense, I'm reminding you fathers. I'm reminding you young men. And then in past tense, he's basically saying, I'm reminding you to remember what I reminded you of. So in other words, there's something happening here that's pretty significant if he's reminding us and then he's reminding us that he reminded us. I can't believe I got through that on three hours sleep. But here's what it is that's important that he's remembering and reminding us to remember. <laughs> Maybe I didn't get through that. I have no idea. <laughs> here's what he's reminding them. Here's the thing of importance. He's telling them who they are in God. And he's reminding them what God has done for them. And he's reminding them where they're going in God. My friends, you can never hear too much that you are chosen by God himself. That you are loved by God. You can never hear too much. You can never be reminded enough. You can never remember to remind yourself to remember that you are forgiven by God himself. You can never be reminded too much that you are growing in God. You can never be reminded too much that you are destined to impact the earth for God, by God. I write to you, and oh, by the way, I just wrote to you who you are in God, the importance of growing in God, and who you're becoming in God. Verse 13, the passage says, I am writing to you young men, because you have overcome the evil one. It says young men, but don't, don't get hung up on gender. He's not writing literally to men. I'll explain this here in just a minute. He's writing to all of us. But he's telling us a stage of growth. Young children, young men, and adults, is not, it's, not a, um, it's not age, it's stage. We're all born again at some chronological age and then we grow and we mature and John's starting to tell us how that works now last week he said I'm writing to you little children and I want to remind you that your sins are forgiven so this first notion of coming to faith in Christ is simply this Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so. I, I don't know anything else that the Bible tells me. But I do know this. Jesus loves me and my sins are forgiven. That is a profound truth. That is, that is one of the greatest blessings you and I can ever have the knowledge of, of encountering. But it's not the only blessing of walking with God. It's blessed, 
But it's not the only blessing. There's more blessing as you and I grow up, and there's more blessing as you and I glow up. You're not only forgiven, but my friends, do not forget. You're forgiven. But you're not only forgiven, you're an overcomer. And it's important to understand that we're forgiven because we're forgiven from the eternal consequences of what we've done. But as an overcomer, you're given the power to not have to live with the temporal consequences, the now consequences of what you've done because available to you is the capacity to no longer act and live in the way that produces the negative consequences. You and I can live by a new code. You and I can exhibit new behaviors in the world. You and I can treat people differently and respond to the treatment of people differently. It's one thing to be forgiven, and all that I've done is not counted against me eternally. It is an additional blessing to be able to live right in the earth and therefore not have to be subject to the consequences that befall those who don't live right. You're an overcomer. And these words are written to us, not by some kind of theoretical theologian. This is written by John, the guy who describes himself as the disciple that Jesus likes the most. Which is a great description, I think, of you. And it's a description of me. We have a God who doesn't play favorites. He just favorites everybody. But this is a John who was present with Jesus for the entirety of his earthly ministry. He was the only disciple that was there at the cross. He was one of two men, he and Peter, who dashed to the tomb when they heard that he wasn't there. He saw him face to face and records it in John chapter 20. Saw him the evening of the resurrection. This is a man who had first-hand encounter, was among the first people in the history of humanity who put their faith in a risen Savior. He is the originator of Jesus loves me. This I know. Because I saw him out of the grave and he forgave my sins. He was at a moment as a fully formed, rugged adult fisherman where he was a baby and brand new, born again forgiven of his sins. But then as he merged through life, he didn't just sit there and go, whew, that was awfully nice of Jesus, you know, to forgive me. He understood the pain that he saw in Jesus, and he understood and was reminded of the teaching of Jesus, and then he's empowered by the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 to not live in a way that he had prior to encountering Jesus. And he writes to us about this idea of, of overcoming There's a period where I'm no longer a baby. I never lose the the wonderment of forgiveness, but all of a sudden I start to understand, yo, I don't have to live like that anymore. And he's eventually, next week, gonna tell us about this maturation into a father, but we're gonna focus here for just a moment on this idea of young men who've overcome the evil one. And John doesn't just go, hey, you've overcome the evil one. We go, oh, that sounds great. He tells us how. Because he repeats it here in verse 14. And he says, I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, young men. This is not a specific gendered term that excludes women, it's a word picture. And how do we know it? Because he also said, I write to you little ones. And he doesn't mean only infants. He means newly born. So he's talking about a stage, and he's given us a very clear picture. There's there's a a stage in our growth where male or female, it doesn't matter, but we start to, in our spiritual life, look like young men. What, What does that mean? You start getting a couple spiritual whiskers. You you start developing a a, a little bit of muscle. And he's not excluding young women, but he's starting to, to call us 
young men because, listen, get these stereotypical 16, 17, 18, 19 year old men, young man. You know why we draft young men to the military? Because they're fearless. 18. Why do we start there? Because they think they're invincible. Think about the stereotypical young adolescent or maturing adolescent, not the locker room smell, but think of, think of the, the stereotype of who they are, right? There's a sense of like, dude, I'm invincible. Like, I can do this, right? They want to, they used to, you know, wrestle you dads, and then all of a sudden they're like, no, like, let's wrestle, and they're like, voices dropped an octave, and you're going, I mean, I still got some old man strength, but I don't know, right? And they want to, they want to test this newfound strength. They want to step out. They're no longer content to be seen as a child anymore. And you hear this in your home if you've parented an adolescent. They're like, stop treating me like a baby. Yes, there's this sense of, I I love the the wonderment of childhood, and I'll slip back there every now and then, but uh, but, uh, that's not who I am anymore, and it's not who I'm becoming. I'm moving forward. I want to be treated in a different way. I want to stand up and be counted in the world. It's a spiritual stage of saying, I'm not just going to kind of sit here and be content just to be forgiven. There's a purpose for the fact that I'm forgiven, and it's to stand up and make a difference. It's to be counted. It's to be invincible. It's to take the fight to the enemy. There's something in adolescence, particularly in adolescent men, that we just see and know. This is a beautiful picture. This is why, like, auto insurance is super expensive for those of you that have had teenage drivers until they're, like, 26. And you're like, dude, in particular for boys, why? Because they're going to go 140 miles an hour, and of course they wouldn't crash. They got it. (laughs) They're going to pack like 17 of their buddies into little, like a little Mazda and crank the music up and go on a 400-mile road trip, right? Like, what? And you're like, be careful. And they're like, I got this. Yes. Gosh, that's a beautiful stage of your spiritual life. You're not afraid of the things you used to be afraid of. Like, you're actually willing to, to take a risk. There are things that God calls you to that feel like a 140 mile an hour car ride. And when we're young and just happy to be forgiven, that, ah, uh, when we're old, we kind of go, no, that's a young person's game. But there's this sweet spot of our spiritual life when we go, oh, go on a mission trip, I'm in. Why not? Jameson standing up here last week at 22 years old, preached the word of God, sure. With confidence and with excellence and with authority. Stand up here and lead worship like Erilyn did. By the way, the whole team was phenomenal. But girl, you crushed it. As a first year high school student, if you don't think that's extraordinary, I'm going to hand you the microphone next week. And you lead us in worship. But to just stand up here and go, sure. Oh, gosh, there's confidence on a young man or a young lady. There's a fearlessness and an invincibility that the world needs out of the followers of Christ. I write to you, young men, why? Because you're strong. You're strong. You see this in young men, sort of this growing sense of of mastery, right? This growing sense of like, I can handle it. Like, I can step up and take my first job and I can manage some finances and I can take responsibility for an automobile. Like, there's a sense of stepping up and growing into a, a new level of mastery. There's this sense of just feeling victorious of, feeling unbeatable you're strong one of the lies i hate the most in modern american christianity is this weak sauce i'm just a sinner saved by grace
Those are the words of a perpetual baby. Let's talk real. Are you a sinner saved by grace? Absolutely. Are you just a poor sinner saved by grace? No, that's somebody who has not let the grace of God form them into what John says, someone who's strong. Strong enough to overcome. I mean, I get, I, I get it. Right? Ultimately, we're dependent on God, and we're sinners, and we're saved by His grace. That is true, and that was last week. But there's a maturation whereby the same stuff that I used to do, it's gone. I've become strong. I'm growing up. I'm not doing the same foolish stuff, and I'm not just sitting there in this sort of passive state. He's called me to be an overcomer. Let me tell you something. Overcoming requires exertion. It's not a passive. You don't just become it with the passing of time. You become it with an exertion of faith. It's active. Strength building. Christians, let me give you permission, if nobody ever has, be strong. Let me give you a kick in the pants, if nobody ever has. Be strong. We don't live in a world that needs more weakness. We need strength that comes from a life that is anchored in God's word and led by his spirit. Got to have it. Ah, young men, you've overcome. How? Because you decided to stop being weak and stop flirting with the same silly sins that you already possess the power to overcome, but you just like them more than you like him. Grab hold of this word. Let it fortify your soul. Put some iron in there. Man up and move forward. He said in so much Christian love. By the way, strength isn't muscle. Strength isn't macho. Strength isn't volume. Strength is this word of God going down inside of you and growing it and growing you into what God wants you to be. I write to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God abides in you. The power of God's word lives in you if you will put God's word in you. Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. I'm forgiven because I know that God loves me and forgave me. And if that is the only bit of the word of God you know, it is powerful enough to move you from death to life. That much. That much can secure your eternity. What if you got the rest of it in you? Let me tell you the transformation from death to life on one simple scriptural truth can be repeated over and over when you're struggling with your identity, when you're struggling with your marriage, when you're struggling with your children, when you're struggling with your own emotion. It's the word of God that just goes life, to, life from death, life from death, life from death, life from death. Put it in you. There's the old saying, you are what you eat. Dude, feast on this thing. Devour it. Right, this idea of like young men. Come on, if you raised a teenage boy, Dude, how, how much do they eat and where do they put it? Right, it's just like, your grocery bill just skyrockets. And you think, what in the heck? Well, there's a couple things. Number one, they're active. <laughs> and number two, they're growing like crazy. And the, the, to grow like crazy, you got to put it in. If you want to grow spiritually and be active, be strong you got to put that word that is alive deep on the inside you might be going how i don't even know where to start 
guess what? We're launching life groups next week. And you can go to your High Point Orlando app, and you can find a group of people that are going to gather every week, eat great food, and talk together about how we apply God's Word to our life. Every single group is going to be taking whatever passage that we're talking about on Sunday, and they're not going to discuss the sermon. You already heard my perspective on it, but you're going to start to unpack that perspective for your own lives. And you can devour the Word with other people who are also becoming strong young men. Shameless plug for my group. It's better than all of them. <laughs> oh, man, I'm sorry, Christy. You just gave me a like. No, it is not. You're right. Your group is also better than everybody else's. You and me. Just kidding. <laughs> I mean, kidding about mine being better. Yours is. You know what? I'm going to move on. Um, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> I write to you, young men, because you are strong, because the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Worship team, would you help me out, please? You have overcome the evil one. Not just evil, but the evil one. You're not overcome by evil, and you're not overcome by the evil one. You overcome the evil one. That's like young man looking at the bully in the schoolyard, right? And you used to go, oh my gosh, I'm a little bit afraid of him. Oh my goodness, he's big. And then like adolescence hit and you grow and your voice drops and your muscle, so you start going, I'm not putting up with his stuff anymore. It's not this generic overcoming evil. It's like, hey, you, you need to back off. There is an evil one that's been harassing you and all of a sudden you come to the realization like, like you know, in third grade, you were bigger than me. In ninth grade, you're not. And you need to stop what you've been doing to me. And in fact, I'm going to do a couple things to you. Young manness overcomes that, that sense of like, dude, I'm not doing this anymore, rises up and overcomes the evil one. Think like a teenager. <laughs> when have you last been given permission to think like a teenager? Not even when you were a teenager. But remind yourself what that felt like when you were invincible. And be active. There's this other thing that starts to happen in adolescence and young madness and becoming a young adult where you start to be able to discern for yourself what's right and what's wrong. You start to be able to look at the world yourself and say what's good and what's not. You know, when you're a child, somebody else informs you of all that. And then as we grow, we start to look and go, I, I, I can overcome not just be forgiven for my mistakes, but I can actually not live the same mistakes because I now can distinguish right from wrong. And now I can use the strength I have to say no to that which I know is destructive for me. And I can start to use that same strength in a discerning way to say yes to that which is good for me. Huh. And as I use my strength to do that over and over, I find myself less likely to choose wrong and dark. And before long, I'm winning. And I'm overcoming. And I'm glowing up. Jesus, we thank you for the truth of your word. I'm asking you, sir, just very simply, you'd help us live it. Help us not be content, although we will never stop being thankful for the fact that we're forgiven. We will be grateful till we meet you face to face and we'll be grateful in your eternal presence that you forgave us and made that way possible. But God, I'm asking you for a church of young men, regardless of how old they are, regardless of whether they're men or women, that would decide we're not content to be children 
We want to overcome like you've called us to. Help us do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand up together. And just as this faith, is, as Keith was just talking about, this faith of young men, young women, to believe that God is going to come through, that he does make a way, that there is such thing as victory when you can't see it. I want to declare this in faith this morning, but I want you to prophesy it over whatever situation, whatever thing that you're looking at right now that you're like, man, I just don't, I'm, I don't feel faith for this right now. I want you to sing, I am going to sing a see a victory. I want you to sing that over that. And I just want us to trust God this morning because he's faithful and he does come through. Amen. There's a QR code. The things that Pastor Keith was encouraging us to do and they're singing about here, we can do better when we do it together. So please think of joining a life group. Check that out and have a great Sunday. Blessings on you all. This is amazing. Thanks, guys.